All right, welcome back. Good to see you all, or some of you. Thank you for turning the cameras on, uh, those of you, so I can see some people. I have to say, I'm very excited. It's sunny outside for the first time in weeks. I don't know, it feels like, it feels like hope, like something to look forward to. I'm, I'm very excited. I'm looking at, yeah, I see people nodding. I'm looking out the window and I see a clear blue sky and sunlight. It was really good. The, um, we have doves on our balcony and they, uh, they just came back a couple of days ago. They were here last year laying eggs and raising chicks and whatever. And they just came back a couple of days ago. So I suspect uh, spring is coming. That's, that's great. All right, so, so let's see. The plan for today is um, the following. Uh, I'd like to, uh, as quickly as possible, go over the readings. Um, I asked you to read two chapters from this qualitative data analysis book for today. Um, and I want to summarize some of the main points from those. Hopefully you've read the details already, um, just so that we're all on the same page. So we can do this as quickly as possible, hopefully. Um, and, um, and, and then sort of do something hands-on. Um, I think this should be fun. We tried this in previous years and I, uh, uh, I think the students endured it in the past. So what I'm gonna ask you to do is uh, live coding, except not the kind of coding that you're maybe used to live coding, but the qualitative kind of coding. So I have already, you're welcome to, to look at this, to peek. Um, and the Google Drive folder that I shared with you before, I just posted, I don't know, an hour ago, um, a few uh, transcripts of some interviews, courtesy of Jim Herbstleb. Um, and um, I'm gonna ask you to do a sort of coding uh, exercise on, on those. Anyway, so that's the plan for today. So hopefully we'll get to that as, as soon as we can. All right, so, um, and, and before I begin, maybe let's let's open this up. Any questions on the readings or thoughts or things like this? Anything that stood out to you? By the way, I am uh, I owe you some feedback on the blog posts. Um, I haven't forgotten. I've just been overwhelmed with stuff, and I haven't gotten around to doing that. So I apologize for the delay there. Um, I'll, I'll get those back to you as soon as I can. All right, so um, let's talk a little bit about um, qualitative analysis. We, we've talked a lot about um, collecting data through interviews, right? Sort of how do you set those up and how do you design an interview guide and sort of how to formulate questions in an, uh, as unbiased way as you can and, and things like that. We talked about that at length in the past, but now you have all of this data that you've collected from your interviews you have these recordings of your uh, interview conversations. You've transcribed them. So you have you know, text, uh, presumably, uh, in front of you from these many interviews. And you have to do something with this. So the question for uh, today and the question for the readings that I asked you to look at is so how do you go from a pile, literally, of text to some meaningful insights? Uh, and this sort of came up in the context of these interviews that we, we talked about in previous lectures, but um, this um, task, this exercise, uh, this process of turning a pile of text into insights using as rigorous and scientific a method as possible um, is actually something that you will probably encounter in a bunch of other scenarios as well beyond interviews. Uh, for example, you might encounter this when you're running surveys that have open-ended questions, which are essentially interviews, right? That's also where you have a, a pile of text that people write as answers to your survey questions. Or um, you know, as part of some human study, you might, uh, so you have people in a lab or whatever, trying out your tool, uh, looking at you, Frank, as we just did this recently. Um, you might ask the participants in your study a, a bunch of questions about sort of their experience with your tool and things like that. Um, and that's also another big pile of text that you have to do something with. And the question is always, uh, how do you go from this big pile of text to some insights that are publishable, right? We're all sort of, you know, graduate students, researchers here um, looking to publish papers. 
how do you go from pile of text to something publishable uh, um, as rigorously as possible without, I don't know, uh, introducing as many uh, biases as, as you might or um, without cherry picking the results or whatever the uh, findings from your uh, data that paint you in a favorable light or paint your tool in a favorable light and so on. So that's kind of the big story here. Um, I, I believe I uh, mentioned this in the past, but just to remind you, I think this is going to be one of the like. There's a couple of these sort of very fundamental skills that if you if you get these right, you could sort of apply this like a hammer to like a million other scenarios. Uh, so this is one of the as far as qualitative stuff goes. This is maybe one of the most useful. You sort of apply this uh, a million other places. Okay, so um, right. So you have all this text, and what do you do with it? How do you go from? Uh, how do you turn this into science? So first step uh, is to uh, abstract a way to organize this text, to so create some abstractions. Um, and we call this coding. We call this assigning codes or coding or labeling, if you will, um, chunks of this data, textual data. We're talking about these, for example, interview transcripts or survey questions or what have you. Um, and the point of this is to help you organize this huge pile of text. It's just too much text to uh, think about uh, at once. So you sort of want to abstract the way, uh, make this easier to organize and easier to analyze and think about and synthesize and so on. Then that's why you're doing this pass of coding or of labeling, right? To, to create these abstractions. Uh, and then you do something with those. You uh, further analyze and aggregate those. You're looking for some patterns kind of spanning uh, across these different codes, uh, some, some meta patterns, uh, if you will. Uh, or you could even use these to, to craft the theory, to build a theory from the ground up. And this is, this is called grounded theory. We're gonna talk more about this, uh, I think next, uh, next time. All right, so um, this is all difficult as I think you will, uh, you'll see as, um, in the later part of today when you get to do this hands-on. So um, you've read this in the, in the book, uh, probably. There's different kinds of codes that you can assign or one can assign to a, a piece of text. For example, you could have descriptive codes that just sort of describe, um, uh, summarize a, a basic uh, topic of a particular fragment of text. You could have, um, so those are descriptive, one type of code. You could have uh, so-called in vivo codes. These are, so this means uh, pulling out some actual quotes from these fragments and using those as codes. So in the example I have here, um, these things I like hated school, stopped caring and so on. These are actual quotes from the uh, study participants. And the researcher here used these fragments of, of quotes, quotes as actual codes. Uh, these are called in, in vivo uh, codes because they're the actual um, fragments of the, uh, the actual uh, transcripts. Um, you could have process codes. So you think of all of the ing ending verbs that describe a particular process that's uh, being talked about or illustrated in that fragment, like spreading rumors, for example, and the fragment you see here on the screen. Or you could have emotions. You could have um, so codes describing the emotions as you inferred the participants uh, experienced them. Or, or as they've mentioned them explicitly, uh, for example, uh, they hated it or, or bitterness uh, and so on. Or um, you could have codes that um, represent values or attitudes or beliefs that the participants uh, have or you infer them to, uh, having. Um, or you, so this is, here's an interesting one. Um, provisional coding assumes you, that you're starting with a pre-existing list of codes from somewhere. You come into your study with this um, and you're applying those pre-existing codes to your um, text, your data. Uh, and as you're doing this, and as you're sort of analyzing this, this data, uh, you're revising and deleting and expanding and so on uh, these codes as needed, but you're sort of coming into your study with the set of codes. 
So can you think of one scenario where this might happen as opposed to um, so building your code book essentially from the ground up uh, as you're as you're reading through and interpreting this data? Can you think of a scenario where you're coming into a study with pre existing codes? Um, maybe possibly in like an area where it's a little bit more defined. So if you're talking to people about their political affiliations, you have certain parties or, you know, undecided or if they voted or not, things like that, that mm -hmm. you can probably definitely apply to the interview. Cool. Yeah, that's that sounds plausible. Um, that's a good example. Where else? Where else could you think of coming in with a pre-existing set of codes? Thanks, Anna. Um, there could be a case where you have like, I guess, initial theory um, about your data, and then you come in with your, uh, I guess, research generated codes from your prior theory. But then of course you might find some new things. So then you modify your theory based off of the information you get, and then you can, um, re I guess, change your- yeah. Uh, yeah, that's great. That's a great example. Thank you. That's, um, uh, that's another one I was looking for. Um, if you're coming in with, um, with some theory, you can think of this coding exercise that you're doing on this new data as hypothesis testing, if you will. You're trying to uh, see how well your data fits this theory that you're coming into the study with. Is there, is there any other scenario? Can you think of anything else? This was very good too. Uh, I was going to say a follow-up study where you want to look for new, like if things like generalize to different cases. So you already have coded other data so you can bring it into the new study? Yep, that's exactly it. That's the, the one I was missing. Um, may, maybe, so I'll give you an example. Um, together with one of my students, we uh, analyzed, uh, we did a case study of the um, uh, NPM JavaScript ecosystem. Uh, and we found some interesting things in the NPM community uh, of JavaScript programmers. Uh, and then we wanted to see uh, how much, if at all, these things that we found to be true for the NPM community uh, hold uh, somewhere else, hold, for example, in the Python community. Um, that's one example. You could, do you remember the Bogart paper, the one about breaking changes that we talked about more towards the beginning that looked at maybe three different communities or something compared and contrasted the R community to the um, Eclipse community to something else? That's, that's one of these, um, uh, another one of these examples where, you know, maybe you've done a study somewhere, you have some findings, you have some theory, uh, and you're looking to see how that applies somewhere else. Right. So um, th those are all great examples. Thank you. Thank you, Jenna and Kyle. Uh, right. We talked about this. So this, we also talked about this. It's sort of the same idea. You can, you can think of, um, if you're coming in with these set of codes from, from somewhere, if you have a theory that, that uh, helped you determine and predetermine these, you could think of this as hypothesis coding, if you will, in the same way that you would think of hypothesis testing in a statistical sense. Um, so you're kind of looking for um, uh, how well your current data fits this uh, pre existing theory and hypothesis that you're coming in. All right, so just to summarize this. Um, one, so one important dimension here, uh, and you've seen examples of both of these, you could think of deductive versus inductive coding. Okay, so deductive coding were the last few examples we talked about, where you're coming in with a start list with a pre-existing set of codes, and you're kind of applying that onto new data as deductive. In the same way that we talked about deductive research earlier on in the semester and sort of hypothesis testing as being so one example of that, uh, as opposed to inductive coding, where you don't come in with any theory or hypotheses, uh, but instead you're building that from the ground up, from the observations and data you've collected from your uh, study participants. Okay, so this is one, one dimension here that's relevant to, to think about uh, coding. Um, and typically one or the other, the, um, the more, I, I think the more common one you will encounter, um, um, 
especially if you're kind of doing your know, tool building um, type research or system building research, and you, you maybe are, are doing interviews or surveys with, with users of your tool, um, is, the, is the more inductive kind, I suppose. You, you, unless you're doing this maybe case study style research where you're looking to see how findings from one case transfer over replicate onto one another, which is maybe less common, um, you're more likely to encounter the inductive style coding, so building the theory from the ground up. Another, right, so this is important. Um, another um, important dimension here is um, when you do this analysis, okay? So think of, and I guess we haven't really seen many examples of that, but think of how um, with more quantitative research, you typically finish collecting all the data before you start analyzing it, right? So you, you, know, you do statistics or whatever um, onto data that you finish collecting. You don't go back and collect more data once you've run some statistics and some analyses on, on those uh, data that you've collected. Um, whereas here, so that's sort of very linear. Uh, data collection happens before analysis. Here, that's absolutely not the case, and it, it, should, it should not be the case. So here you see um, in, in all of these examples, you see sort of analysis happening concurrently with data collection. So um, you know, maybe you collect a few interviews and you start analyzing those. And um, so seeing what you're learning from this and so how you might need to refine your interview guide and what questions you might need to drop or, or add or what, whatever. We talked about this before when we talked about sort of setting up interviews. Um, and this, this is a must here because you're sort of building this understanding from the ground up. It's a must that you do this concurrently. If you wait until the very end, there's a much higher risk that you will have uh, asked the wrong questions or, or collected the wrong data and so on. And so missed a great opportunity to learn something more useful. Okay, so it's important that you do this concurrently. Um, it doesn't mean that you to do this literally after every single interview, but um, it probably means that you do this after every few interviews. You sort of take a step back and kind of start uh, looking at the things you've collected before running more interviews, for example. The same with surveys or, or, or other things. Um, right. Um, another thing, we're going to talk more about this um, later, but um, it's really important that you um, define operationally um, all of these um, codes as precisely as possible. Um, this is important for um, trustworthiness, verifiability, reproducibility reasons. If uh, so, remember, this is an inherently subjective process, right? If um, in addition to the inherent and unavoidable subjectivity of this whole process, you're further uh, adding uh, even more ambiguity and, and confusion by being imprecise with what you mean with these codes, that makes it even worse than it, than it already is. So it's really important that you be very clear about you know, defining every code and so on. So that, for example, um, if two researchers are independently coding, say, different halves of the data that you've collected, of the interview transcripts you've collected, they would uh, be mostly consistent, right? If not entirely consistent in, in their coding. Uh, so that people could, so that other people could uh, arrive at compatible conclusions to the ones you would have arrived at. Um, or even for yourself over time, right? So that, you know, your later interviews are uh, interpreted and analyzed in the same way as your earlier ones, for, for example. Um, right, and it's like this is a common question that comes up. So it's what's the like what's the right level of detail? Um, if you have I don't know a forty-five minute interview uh, and the transcript from that, that uh, it's going to be heaps of text. Imagine how much uh, one person can. Um, speak in 45 minutes and so how much text that would uh, correspond to right so it doesn't mean you have to code every single word every single sentence every single paragraph like you know, how what, what's the level of detail at, at which you should be coding um so 
there's no easy answer to this, but it's uh, obviously not every portion of the transcript must be coded. So that much you uh, you can um, you can assume, um, and it's also possible that multiple codes apply to the same um, piece of text, no matter how small. Remember, because we talked about uh, how the codes can be of very different nature, right? So it could be a process code, it could be an, I don't know, a descriptive code, it could be an emotion code, it could be a value belief code, it could be a, and so on and so forth code, right? So those aren't mutually exclusive. They could, you know, they could apply to the same piece of text. So that's also possible. Um, in general, the way you should think of this is um, the same as the way you should think about anything really. So driven by your research questions and your theory, if you will, right? So like how does, um, you know, if you're in doubt whether to code a particular passage of your transcript or not, ask yourself, you know, is this part of my research question? How does this contribute to my research question? And if, if not at all, then, you know, you could skip that and, and move on to the next one, right? Um, it's not about coding literally everything in your transcript, but it's about um, answering your research questions. All right, so that was that was a step one. That was the easy easy part. The easy part was um, creating these abstractions to help you organize this data. So what do you do next? What do you do when you have this? You uh, start to look for patterns in this data. So that can mean lots of things. Um, it can mean that you're um, looking to um, find themes among these different uh, codes that you've assigned in the first pass. Uh, or categories, if you're looking to categorize um, the things you've coded uh, into higher or higher level themes, that's typically needed because typically you will have lots of lower level codes that by themselves don't tell any sort of particularly interesting story. You'll sort of want to look for um, higher level patterns among those. So you know you'll, you'll start thinking about what's similar and what's different between so uh, two. Uh, elements that have been coded with, with different codes and so on. Uh, that's one. Another one is looking for causes or explanations. So that's another type of pattern that you're looking to uh, maybe extract from these first order codes. Um, or uh, relationships among uh, people um, or um, theoretical constructs. And this goes back to uh, grounded theory, which we will talk about more uh, next time. But either way, um, there's some second level um, abstraction and analysis step here uh, that has to happen uh, going from these or first pass codes to some publishable results. So um, this was the example from the book. Uh, there's more than one way to find these higher level patterns. Um, so they gave this example of um, codes that a researcher has assigned to some, uh, some data um, related to the first month of withdrawal symptoms described by a participant in a smoking cessation treatment program, somebody looking to quit smoking. So these are so the first, uh, first pass codes that the researcher assigned. Anxiety, nervousness, restlessness, deep breathing, throat burning, I felt like crying, uh, hurt someone bad, angry, eating a lot more, wandering around, habitual movements, memories of smoking, and smelling new things. Um, and you can see how uh, different codes here are of different type. Uh, we talked about types before. So um, how do you go from just the raw codes that you've assigned your labels to some patterns? What might some patterns be? So for example, um, a very um, intuitive pattern or way of, of creating these patterns is to group the codes by type, right? So you could group all the emotions together, you could group all the processes together, you could group all the descriptors together and so on, right? So that would give you something like this, okay? But the book talks about how you know, this is maybe not the most meaningful way of finding uh, meaningful patterns here. Maybe the one about emotions is sort of interesting and meaningful, but the ones about processes and descriptors aren't, aren't super interesting um, here. 
So maybe a better way is to sort of recategorize these um, in, into sort of something that uh, makes better sense together. So for example, um, here, uh, in addition to emotions, which we uh, carried over from the first version of this, um, we've grouped together codes that talk about physical changes. We see uh, deep breathing and throat burning and eating a lot more and smelling new things. All of these are things that have to do with physical changes. Okay? And um, we group those together. Um, things that um, have to do with so this um, restlessness, this restless journey of wandering around and habitual movements and so on, those being grouped together. Um, things that have to do with um, memories and regrets and, and, and regretful loss, uh, memories of smoking, fall like crying, things that um, make you think of the past, those being grouped together, and so on. This is arguably uh, a better way, not the only way, definitely not the only way. Remember, this is a um, subjective process. It's so the researchers that are uh, assigning these, interpreting, creating these interpretations. But this is arguably a better way than the one that's just grouping by type, which is probably not very interesting. Um, right, so we talked about how there are others. So what happens next is, um, especially with something like grounded theory, where, uh, what's a theory? Let's step back. What were the elements of a theory? We talked about this a few lectures ago. What do we need to call something a theory? Well, some, at the very least, some elements, some concepts, right? There's, there's something that, some, some theoretical constructs, some concepts that, um, are part of that theory. What else besides some concepts or constructs? What else do we need? Is it enough to just have a, I don't know, a basket of constructs and call that a theory? I mean, you need relationships between them, cause and effect relationships typically. Mm -hmm. And if you're really good at this, or the theory is really good, rather, not you, if the theory is really good, you also explain the mechanism through which those cause and effect relationships occur. Right. So um, for theory, you need some constructs some concepts uh, and some relationships between them. And uh, they tend to be causal, but not necessarily. Uh, and maybe you can even explain the mechanism. That's a bonus. Right. So, so as you're... Um, uh, having these patterns, right, that you sort of st started creating from your first order codes, you could start thinking about how to organize them towards the theory, if that's your goal here. If the goal is to build theory, uh, and we'll see more of what that means specifically when we talk about grounded theory. Um, but if the goal is to build theory, then you sort of have to think about relationships, have to think about so cause and effect relationships, have to think about mechanism, and you sort of, as your um, finding these second order patterns, you sort of have that in mind and you're sort of looking for patterns of this uh, flavor, right? That sort of talk about relationships between things and, and cause and effect and so on. So, so this would be one, this is an example from the book, it would be one um, way of visually representing the um, uh, codes, from the first pass. Um, and the, so he, you see here in the um, ovals, the circles, you see the second uh, order patterns. So the groups of codes together, right? The patterns that um, were um, created as part of the second round, this, um, aggregation abstraction round. Um, and you see in the, in the square boxes, the actual individual codes that make up those groups, if you will. Right, so this is a one way of visually organizing all of this data as you're, as you're creating it. Uh, and 
you see the arrows there um, representing maybe theorized causal relationships between these or, or things like that. So uh, this is sort of one way in which you can sort of um, move towards creating such a theory uh, graphically um, by organizing these things as you're building them. Um, all right, and so this um, is another one of these things that is um, important. Um, as you're doing all of this, uh, all of what we discussed before, um, you shouldn't do this in your head. Okay, so the book talks about how um, you should do this on, on paper, in writing, not on paper, in writing, as opposed to um, just sort of mentally, as a mental exercise. Uh, and that means creating these analytic memos as you're um, analyzing more of your, your data and um, noting, the, documenting these reflections in your sort of thinking processes about the data as you're going about analyzing it, um, right? So it's important here to um, include these sort of higher level inferences and, and analytic meanings that you have created, you've extracted from the data, not just summaries of the data. That's not very interesting. Um, and uh, essentially this, this helps you form this theory that we, we talked about before. Um, so, you can think about including assertions and propositions. Assertions are um, uh, descriptive, uh, basic descriptive things. Uh, it's just facts. Think of assertions as facts. Uh, so for example, um, a, an assertion could be that overall the participants seemed uh, engaged with the NL2 code tool uh, that uh, Stu built, if you remember the example from a few lectures ago. So this is an assertion. It's a summary. It's a fact. The participants seemed engaged, seemed to enjoy um, using the tool. That's an assertion. A proposition is uh, one level higher still uh, of, of interpretation because um, it um, gets closer to these relationships and, and causal mechanisms that we talked about. For example, one proposition could be that Having pull requests rejected can be demotivating for contributors who are already demoralized by low self-confidence in their programming expertise. So you see here are relationships between pull request rejection um, and, and motivation. And you see that relationship be mediated by how much confidence that people had in their own programming expertise. So you see that these different constructs be part of this proposition and the relationship between them be made explicit. And so what the causal mechanism might be and, and how they might influence each other, what the relationship might be, you see that be made explicit. So this is more than just a fact. This is not a fact. This is an inference, a proposition that you make uh, and to a higher level uh, of meaning that you assign to this data, okay? Uh, so these are the kinds of things that it's good to write down as you're doing this analysis. And this should be on paper, not in writing, not just in your head. All right, any, any questions on, on any of these? Okay, in, in that case, the, the other thing that's important to note here is um, how do you know if you can trust and what does that even mean? Like how, how valid like can we talk about validity when it comes to qualitative research and qualitative analysis in the way that we could talk about validity when it comes to numbers and statistics and things like that? What, what does that mean for something that is inherently subjective? What does it mean for something like that to be valid? And so this was the other chapter, chapter 11 from the book um, that talks about this. So um, here's a few scenarios, few sources of um, biases, mistakes, um, threats to validity that, that might occur. 
Um, one, the holistic fallacy. So you as a human, presumably you are, um, you have a tendency, uh, all of us do, to find patterns where there aren't any. So there's, there will be this natural human tendency to see patterns in, in this data that you're looking at, uh, even though there might not be any there. So that's a, you know, one type of bias that you should be aware of as you're doing something that's inherently subjective or, or uh, objective. Uh, you will see how uh, even, even with numbers, the interpretation of those numbers is still a subjective thing. And there's lots of room for something like this to play out there as well. Uh, I have some very cool drama stories that we're gonna talk about later in the semester uh, of how um, the two sets of researchers looked at the same numbers and arrived at fundamentally different conclusions. It's very interesting. Um, another one, uh, elite bias. So for example, here, you might be tempted to overweigh data coming from high status participants and to downweigh data coming from less um, high status participants, or maybe overweigh data coming from people you know versus data coming from people you don't know if you end up interviewing uh, people that you know. Or personal biases, you might just sort of have your own political agendas, uh, whatever those might be that kind of bias the way you're, uh, you're, you're looking at this data and you're interpreting it. Um, that might explain why uh, different researchers you know, looking at the same data might arrive at different conclusions, for example, too. Um, or there's the risk of going native, meaning of losing your outsider perspective and, and so just becoming kind of um, one of the, essentially one of the participants and, and um, losing your objectivity in that sense. So when we talk about qualitative analysis or qualitative research, um, we talk about confirmability uh, as sort of one of these goals that we should pursue. So here, um, confirmability is concerned with establishing that the researchers' interpretations and findings are clearly derived from the data that they started from as opposed to just invented, okay? Uh, th there has to be this clear relationship between the raw data that the researcher started from, which for example, would be the in interview transcripts in, in, in our case here, uh, and the findings uh, and interpretations that you claim in your publications, in your papers. So you have to demonstrate how your conclusions and interpretations have been uh, reached, how they've come to be. Um, and there's three elements of this, of confirmability, three elements to so keep in mind as you're doing this. And this goes back a, a long way. It's a very famous uh, paper that uh, introduced this notion. Um, they are credibility, transferability, and dependability. So, um, right, so let's, let's look at what those mean. Credibility, is determined when other researchers or the readers of your papers, um, when they're confronted with this experience, they can recognize it. So um, phase validity, if you will, uh, that's sort of maybe another um, term for, for this. So essentially credibility addresses the fit between the respondents' views and your representation of those views in your analysis, right? So how accurate, how well does your representation of people's views actually match their views? Okay? That's about credibility. Um, and there's a few strategies to increase the credibility of your study. Um, so let's look at what some of these are. So prolonged engagement is one of them. This means that you um, spend enough time conducting your study, um, uh, collecting the data and analyzing it and so on. Uh, 
to obtain an, an adequate representation of the views of the participants on their study, as opposed to sort of shallowly and quickly uh, doing this. So remember when we um, went over all of the examples of um, interview papers last week? Remember how they um, reported, uh, researchers, the authors reported how their interviews took anywhere between, I don't know, half an hour and three hours in, in some of the cases? Right, so that's a one example where um, even at the data collection phase, right, the researchers sort of spent a, su a sufficient period of time uh, collecting the raw data, and presumably they also spent a sufficient period of time afterwards analyzing it. But, but the, the point is, you know, you sort of have to be thoughtful and, and um, put enough time and effort into this. Uh, oh yeah, you. You've probably heard about this, a very famous social psychology effect going back to the 1920s or something, the Hawthorne effect, do you know about this? Basically the idea is that participants alter their behavior when observed. And you've probably seen this in like different flavors. Um, I also like complained about this in, um, in, in class, I don't know, uh, before when I, said that people would just tell you what you want to hear as opposed to what they're actually thinking. All right, so that's, that's kind of the same idea here. Um, they, um, it's sort of, the distinction is between what the participants want us to see versus what's really going on when no one is watching. So one way to think about this, All right? So, you know, of course, um, when you ask them how, Frequently, if at all, people, uh, I don't know, people pick their noses, they're going to say, oh, we never do this. It's, they'll be shameful or something, right? And, uh, you know, maybe they do that a lot when no one's watching. Who knows? Okay, so that's sort of the idea. Um, and so interestingly, I just read this paper um, and I've uh, I pasted the reference at the end of the slide deck here. So I encourage you to look at this. Um, super interesting. Do you know how there's been this uh, drama, replication drama in social psychology? Also lots of very famous um, foundational um, results in social psychology uh, cannot be replicated. No, no, but you should, you should look into it. It's very fascinating. Uh, talking about reproducibility and, and open science and so on. Um, so uh, this paper that I, that I read uh, had looked at the body of research uh, into the Hawthorne effect and found, uh, this is a quote from the paper, evidence of a Hawthorne effect is scant, amounts to little more than a good story. So it's interesting, right? So I, you know, I, I don't really have a, a, an opinion about this, but it seems like um, you know, maybe we should revisit this. Maybe it's not as as obvious as, um, as we thought it, um, it is. But okay, so anyway, so that was, that was about um, prolonged engagement, spending enough time with the participants and with the data. Another strategy to increase credibility is persistent observation. So this means if, so if uh, prolonged engagement was about scope, persistent observation excuse me, is about depth. So um, here you want to sort of separate relevant from irrelevant observations, and you want to um, extensively focus and study those that are relevant and in scope for your study. Okay, so um, just focus on the things that help address your, your research questions, and so do that deeply and consistently across the different interviews that you're analyzing. Um, another strategy is triangulation here. You could think of this uh, along, so triangulation just means using multiple uh, data sources, methods, researchers, what have you, theories, if you will, uh, to obtain corroborating evidence, right? If, if you um, identify something using different methods from different sources, whatever, you're, you're more likely to uh, have identified something genuine and, and therefore you should believe it uh, more than if it's just a, if it's just a one off. So that's the basic idea behind triangulation. And um, you can think of this um, either at the data level. So um, for example, we talked about how um, 
you might do these multiple case studies, right? And, you know, uh, I gave you an example of one that I uh, uh, worked on where we wanted to see if whatever we found and, and learned from this sort of one community, one domain carries over to others. So that's one example of data triangulation. Uh, or uh, it could be triangulation of the investigator, of the researcher, right? Uh, multiple teams looking at the same phenomenon, multiple researchers looking at the same phenomenon, or of the theory or of the methods. This is another one that's very common where um, you will see uh, different research methods being combined uh, in such a way that um, one allows to triangulate the findings of the other. So for example, uh, I could combine a qualitative analysis with some quantitative analysis uh, that's looking at the same phenomenon in, in, a, in a different way, in a slightly different way, and, and see if I have some supporting evidence from both. Okay. Finally, um, another strategy worth mentioning uh, to increase the credibility of your study is member checking. So you remember the Bogart paper uh, that we read a while back? This was very cool. So they, this is a quote from the paper. What the researchers did is they, after they conducted their analysis, so they had run a survey or something or, or interview, I don't remember, uh, and they had some qualitative analysis and they had um, arrived at some interpretations from that qualitative analysis. But what they did next uh, was really interesting and rare. They took the summary of these findings and look at this a full draft of the sections of the paper. Can you imagine this? They, they wrote the paper, you know, more than an hour before the deadline. That's for, you know, at, at least that. Um, and they were able to take those sections and uh, go with them back to participants and ask the participants to smell check their findings in the paper. Like, hey, you know, am I, am I interpreting Am I representing your views accurately in this summary and this write-up? Like, does this capture what you told me in the interview? Okay. So this is an example of member checking. And um, I think how rare it, it is that people actually do this in, in research papers. Another super cool example of this was from, uh, from last week, the sex workers, workers paper. Do you remember this one? they had hired one of the sex workers as a consultant on the research project uh, to uh, review their protocol for appropriateness and so on, and to smell check everything they were doing, see if it makes sense. Okay, so it's another example of member checking. Again, super rare that people do this and you know, awesome when you see examples of this. All right, so, this was credibility, okay? Um, we talked about how there's three, uh, three sort of characteristics that are uh, worth uh, pursuing. The other one is transferability and dependability. The other two, sorry, credibility, transferability, dependability. So transferability means essentially generalizability. So um, can I uh, transfer these insights, these interpretations, um, anywhere else, or do they apply solely to the sample of um, participants or whatever that I that I studied here in this particular study? That's that's the idea. Um, and you know, it, if something is more transferable, more generalizable, um, it's also more um, believable, I guess. Right, because chances are that if you were to so look at a different sample, you might find the same, you might reach the same conclusions. As opposed to if something is very sample specific, then you can you can expect by construction that if you look somewhere else, you you won't find the same uh, the same phenomenon. Um, so, like one good practice here um, is as you're writing these things up, to provide thick is the word descriptions of the the data. Meaning, you know, uh, quotes from all the participants to illustrate all the different themes and quotes and, and things that you come up with. Um, so that um, readers who seek to transfer your findings, your interpretations somewhere else, 
can judge based on the actual raw data, these quotes, can judge the extent to which those might transfer, as opposed to from your uh, summaries and your interpretations, which are many steps removed from the, the raw uh, data. That's one practice there. Um, dependability uh, is about basically um, doing, setting up your study and your analysis in a principled way uh, and so documenting clearly and, and motivating well all of the different steps you took uh, in, in the study design and uh, data collection and, and analysis. Um, so here it's good to leave a detailed audit trail. So this means um, carefully describing in the paper uh, all of these different things that somebody else uh, would need to um, be able to clearly follow your study design decision trail. Does that make sense? They could, uh, they could replicate and, and redo uh, an analysis sim similar to yours. Um, right, so ideally they would arrive at comparable, but not contradictory, right, conclusions if presented with the same data and, and perspective and situation and so on. If somebody else were to, to do what you just did, they should arrive at some, the, the same ideally, if, if not very similar and comparable, at the very least compatible conclusions, not contradic contradictory conclusions. So remember the example I gave you, we're gonna come back to this. Uh, so two research teams looking at essentially the same data coming up with fundamentally different conclusions, right? That should not happen. Um, all right, and this, um, I won't go over all of these. There's lots of things that you should um, make deliberate decisions about and document clearly in your write-ups uh, as you're writing up these analyses. And um, actually it's more better than reading these abstractions here, uh, go back to the lecture from last week and look through the description of those interview studies and sort of look at the things those authors um, described in their, in their write-ups of these interview studies. Um, and there's some reference here for a, a checklist of things to include as you're, as you're doing this. Um, okay, one, one side question. What about the data itself? Should you share transcripts, for example? Looking at you, Hannah. Yeah, I mean, it would depend on a couple of things. First, what exactly they consent to. Um, and then even above that, sort of the, like for CMU, we have IRB. So the people who review it and um, basically anybody on the IRB is able to view the transcripts, but not anybody outside of it. And generally with people's data, you should be very mindful about anonymizing information and uh, don't want to, have anything out there that could potentially identify anyone, you know, especially if they didn't agree to that and they didn't know that going in. Mm -hmm. Is there any value in doing this though? Like, what's the point? Why it seems complicated and sensitive. Why would you bother doing it? If at all. Well, if you want reproducibility, um, you should definitely share your data. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you want me to trust your findings and interpretations and claims and conclusions, I am more likely to do so if I'm able to verify them by looking at the data myself. Um, and that's true of any nature of data, be it qualitative or quantitative. So that's that's the point. Um, and I, you know, also it, um, for example, can enable. Um, additional research easier with a lower startup costs. Remember how um, there's so many different ways in which you can code the same piece of data, for example, and even different people might uh, arrive at different conclusions looking at the same 
piece of data. So if, if I can get away without um, collecting that data in the first place, but I'm somehow interested in it nonetheless, then you know it's, an, it's a good way to enable more research this way. And you could use that for teaching and whatnot. Um, but um, you sort of have to be mindful of your relationship with the interviewees and uh, institutional constraints like the IRB and, and privacy and, and so on. Uh, legislation in some cases that might um, limit what you can and cannot um, share. All right, so just to, to summarize this, there's three approaches to um, this kind of qualitative analysis of text. Um, this is from a really good summary paper that I, uh, that I linked there at the bottom. So one is um, the, so conventional type of analysis, qualitative analysis, is the one that starts from observations, like your interview data, and um, builds codes and um, interpretations from the ground up. That's the one we talked about. Um, and that's the one that I think you will encounter most often. But you can also have the other uh, scenario, which we also talked about at the beginning, where you start your study from some theory or some, some uh, previous uh, findings and, and so on. Um, and the codes are predefined and uh, from, from the theory on the previous studies uh, and only refined and extended and, and so on as part of your current one. We talked about these two. The one we didn't talk about at all, um, and we're not gonna right now uh, because it's relatively rare, um, is the one uh, is the sort of summative uh, qualitative content analysis where you start from some keywords rather than um, either of the other two. Um, and these are um, keywords, some of them are pretty fine, some of them might emerge during the analysis. Um, and they, um, um, for example, you could, um, I've seen one example of this where people uh, try to quantify the frequency of occurrence of certain keywords uh, in different uh, study groups or participant groups or uh, things like this. So you, you'll see uh, so this is more of a combination of qualitative and quantitative, uh, if you will. Some quantitative analysis done on, on qualitative data. Um, I think this is rarer, so I, I'm not gonna talk about this uh, more now. Um, okay, yeah, so this, we sh I feel we should talk a little bit about, more about this, uh, but I wanna do that next time. Um, this is from a, a paper you see there, um, people complaining that often researchers use the term grounded theory very loosely. Um, and um, these are authors who are unfamiliar with qualitative research uh, or uh, wish to avoid close description or illumination of their methods. That sounds really bad, either one of those, but it gets worse, more, more disturbing perhaps is that it becomes apparent when one pushes them to describe their methods that many authors hold some serious misconceptions about grounded theory. I feel like we should spend a little bit of time clearing these misconceptions. Um, I'm gonna ask you to read um, a few things for, for Tuesday. Uh, I'll send those uh, out after class. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about this on Tuesday to, um, to clarify what grounded theory is and isn't with respect to this qualitative content analysis or thematic analysis that we talked about today and that you read about in, in the book for today. Right? So the two are often conflated. People often call this thematic analysis grounded theory. So technically, um, there's more to grounded theory than just... Um, thematic analysis, but this is part of it uh, too. So that's why the confusion. Anyway, we'll, we'll talk a little about this next uh, time. So, okay, so with the little time we have left, um, I'd like to propose that we do the following. So let's just split up in two groups. And um, I, so in the same Google Doc, sorry, Google Drive folder that I posted, uh, in the Slack channel, let me post a, a link to that in the Zoom chat as well, if you're not in Slack right now. Um, there is um, 
a PDF with some interview transcripts. Here. Um, so if you go to the qualitative analysis folder, there's a PDF with the transcripts there. What I'd like to ask you to do is, and we have to adjust the times a little bit because um, we don't have as much time as I budgeted here. Um, so how about we, uh, instead of reading all the transcripts there, we just read the first one or two um, and try to answer this research question. Why do people participate in corporate hackathons? That's the research question for this study. Okay, so imagine you have conducted a series of interviews or your fellow researchers, colleagues have conducted a series of interviews uh, and uh, I've given you transcripts of those interviews where people talk about their experience with these hackathons. Your research, your goal, research goal is to answer this question. Why do people participate in corporate hackathons? So I'd like you to develop some codes uh, and apply them to the transcripts uh, and you know, compare notes among yourselves and report back. Uh, and um, the reason why I'm asking to, you to do this in two groups is to see how different or how consistent the two sets of codes will be between the two groups, okay? So I'd like to save, we have a, until what, 340? I'd like to save these five minutes or so for discussion. So let's try to do this in 10 minutes, okay? Can you, can you confirm that you can find the PDF to look at? Yes. So here are two breakouts. Just do look at the first two, not more than that, because we don't we won't have time to read all of them. Welcome back. So moment of truth. I have in front of me a blank slide that I'm gonna be typing these codes in. So let's see, can, um, from the first group, can we get a set of codes that you have assigned to fragments of the transcripts? Who is the first group? Oh, um, I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. a, a group. How about, how about my group since I said a word? Um, I forget who took notes. Do you wanna just like copy paste them into Slack so he doesn't have to type them all out? Would oh, that that'd be great. I can do that. We broke it into like four high level categories and each of them has several things under it. I love it. Yeah, the other group too, if you could paste it in the Slack channel, that'd be great. Um, and I'll put that in, in the slide deck. Or or the Zoom chat, that's fine too. Oh, here's one. So should I read these? These are headings and then like yes. sub, yeah, exactly. Cool, okay. What about the other group? Um, should we just type them in the Slack then, or? Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, so I could, okay. I could put them up on the screen. We just happened to type them out. I... Um, I, I appreciate that. I should have asked you to do that myself. <laughs> 
that's all awesome. Are these, uh, I guess, the equivalent of the higher level ones? Um, so I think we we slightly miscalculated the amount of time we set up, we set for uh, a discussion, so we didn't have really a chance to refine them. Um, uh, no, no worries. So let's see. Let's look at this a little bit. Um, I see CJ, is that in, in addition to Kyle's or? Yeah, right, right. Because we didn't get a chance to consolidate so but yeah. I see, I see, I see, I see. I see. So let's see, how does this compare? So I'm seeing here. So fun. Something enjoyable. So people enjoy participating in these. The reason they participate is because they enjoy is kind of one theme you're finding in group one. They enjoy doing so. They participate for self-improvement. They participate. for the opportunities to innovate or learn about innovations, I take it, and professional development. Is that different from self-improvement? Maybe not, I unclear. Think, I think one of them mentioned specifically like not, not being able to do something professionally and wanting to do it otherwise. Mm -hmm. I think that's where that came from. Let's see, and here we have in group two, Some of the same, meeting new people, having fun. Some of these ones we've seen in the other group as well. Passion and interest, that resonates. Creativity. So I'm guess, look, so interesting, see, even this small uh, exercise that we did now on, on a small fragment, you already see quite some differences between the sets of codes that the two groups came up with. So for example, this entire line of codes about self-improvement, I'm not seeing that in the second group. I see that's sort of one, one big difference in how you interpreted the same, the same data. It's very interesting. Okay, good. So um, let me not keep you like I usually do over time. Um, I already have developed a reputation for that. Thank you for this. Let's stop here. Um, for next week, Tuesday, um, I uh, would like you to read a few more things. I'm going to send those out uh, later this evening or so. Um, but this class is a lot of reading, but uh, that's okay because we, we don't have time to cover everything in lecture. So um, there's some assigned reading, but no other homework for next week, Tuesday. And otherwise, I'll see you then. Okay, thank you.